Off we go. We're live. So uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back to this is our fourth go around with what we've come to call the approach. So this is where I, I'm Chris Steele. I'm the pastor at St. Christopher's here in Dallas. And I try to get one of my colleagues on the hook every week to uh, come with us and take our we call it the approach because it's our first look really at the lessons for the week and just kind of giving us an idea. We read them aloud and we just spitball about the kind of directions we might take, you know, what kind of rabbit holes we might chase. And so this week I have, uh, I have with us, this is Mother Rebecca Tankersley. She is the uh, Associate Rector. Tell me what your, tell me what your title is and what your portfolio is because I've, I've lost track somewhere along the way since yeah. all this has gone down. I'm the associate rector. Um, often we append to that for formation, but there's only one of me. So I'm the associate rector at Church uh -huh. of the Transfiguration here in Dallas. And I do oversee all of our formation activities. I've got some great talented folks who do the lion's share of the work on youth and children's ministry, leaving me uh, overseeing our adult formation programs. And then, you know, other duties as assigned from time to time. So Excellent, excellent. Well, we uh, we're very glad to have you, and uh, and why don't we? We'll open with a prayer. This is the collect from the previous week, uh, the fourth Sunday of Epiphany, the one we've been praying all week. So the Lord be with you, with you, and also with you. Let us pray, Almighty and everlasting God. You govern all things, both in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people. And in our time, grant us your peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right. So let's I'm going to take a look here. Um, what we so Rebecca, tell us about how you're worshiping uh, at Transfiguration. We uh, our St. Christopher's people know we're we're in indoors every week. And what we've been doing is we've been reading the Old Testament and the gospel. So that's generally what we've been doing here. But tell us a little bit about how worship is going up way on up north at Transfiguration on the far, far side of 635. In the great white north. You know, right. what here is, is a, a combination of things and it is in transition. We have been worshiping um, in two primary ways. We've been recording a service on Wednesday afternoons that airs live on Facebook and YouTube at nine o'clock in the morning on Sundays. And then in addition to that online offering, we have had an outdoor service at 1130 in the morning on Sundays. Uh, we have just been very, very blessed recently by a gift that um, was made to our capital campaign, which got suspended because of COVID tide, but the gift came in anyway designated to be used for camera equipment. So we are about to begin live streaming the online offering of worship. Okay. And that'll happen live streaming at nine o'clock on Sundays and then the outdoor service uh, at 1130. So um, yeah, things are in flux, but for the vast majority of this, our time of COVID, uh, we have actually had this bizarre situation where we have to be ready to preach for Sunday by Wednesday afternoon. Um, which is just, you know, as you know, as a that's as crazy a priest, talk, it's crazy talk. And it leaves us all wondering, you know, when exactly are we supposed to have a day off in between? <laughs> <laughs> so I, for one, am thrilled to return to like all the worship taking place on Sunday as it should. <laughs> right. But you only do it every other week or so, right? I only preach every other week or so. That's right. True. Yeah, uh, I've yeah. got it every Sunday. Small place like this, you have it every Sunday. So you do, yeah, you do. Yeah. In any case, well, let's take a look. So, um, so I just have to say before we start, I'm not preaching this week. So just as you normally have this be your first look, this is uh -huh. my first look. Excellent. So. All right. <laughs> just because otherwise you'd be frantically finishing up and getting ready to go on camera. We're preaching to y'all instead of you know thinking about things. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Well, I would be, I, I, I would be stealing it anyway. So, <laughs> my uh, one of our homiletics professors in seminary used to say, "If you hear a good sermon, steal it." Yep. Right. Um, there are only, you know, there are only so many cute childhood stories you can tell, right? Huh. Uh, so I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna go ahead and put up the, um, the lessons for the week, and 
Rebecca, there are a lot of things I admire about your priestcraft, but she, uh, among the things I like most is the way you read scripture aloud. Would you uh, grace us with that? I've got it. I've got it up here. You may have it next to you, but this is our Old Testament lesson for uh, for this coming Sunday, and we'll we'll dive into that a little bit, and then. Uh, a little later on, we'll look at look at the gospel lesson, but w- would you grace us with that? I would love to. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows upon them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name. Because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, this is certainly a long one. Um, (laughs) You know, so Rebecca, one of the reasons I asked you to read that again, I, I I've I've heard you do this before in several settings, and I, I really like the way that you use your voice to read. And one of the things I was I was thinking about as we we're get getting ready for this is, you know, what is the difference between just just reading this like like we would in the daily office, right, or we would in a Bible study? What is what is it about? Do you think hearing it read aloud? that makes it so much different from, from when we would just sit down and read it with, um, with a critical, ac- ac- almost academic eye. What, what is that uh, for you? I, I'm not sure I can put a finger on it, but I thought maybe you might have some insight on that. Well, particularly in a passage like this where God is speaking mm-hmm. to God's people, it feels to me, particularly if I'm not the one who's reading it aloud, if someone is reading it aloud to me, it is helpful for my ears and the part of my brain to which my ears are connected to hear that word spoken to me uh, and to um, have an experience of actually hearing the word of God um, as a prophet would have, for example. Um, We just uh, unfortunately don't have these wonderful experiences like like those in in ancient of days did where they they heard the voice of the Lord speak regularly. Uh, For me, I don't know about you, those those moments are few and far between in my spiritual life. And so I get a a little um, dose of that every time I hear the word spoken aloud. Yeah, well, I, I, go ahead. That's another, from the perspective of somebody hearing it, I don't know if I'm hitting the nail on the head, but before Father Chris even asked that question, I thought, wow, that is just for whatever reason, and maybe it's because of you reading it, so comforting that in a way that has not struck me before. I mean, it's a wonderful passage, but that was, 
very comforting. So thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. My pleasure. I've hit the emotional, you know, nerve or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what I think, and I, and, I, and I think right now, all of us are a little lonely, you know, waiting for a voice. We, you know, so much of our, of our work is done by email or uh, by messages back and forth. Um, I'm not, I don't spend a lot of time on the phone. I think when we do these Zooms, that's probably the large, the biggest chunk of interaction I have, but hearing, hearing voices do that. And I, I think you're right. You know, hearing the voice of God is, is great, but it's also, you know, we talked a bit about this last week, how it's always mediated, right? So last week, it was don't talk to us directly. Always send some Deut in Deuteronomy, send somebody to tell us what God is saying because we don't want to hear from you ourselves, right? That's a scary thing. And and, and sometimes it, it can be scary just the words. And I'm I'm looking at the first the first half here. Mm -hmm. Um creating the world, stretching it out, stretching out the heavens like a curtain. Uh, the inhabitants are like grasshoppers. And I'm not sure whether that is, I'm not sure that's a compliment or if that's a good thing. I mean, yeah. certainly, certainly there are, when you say things like grasshoppers in this context, you would always have heard about multitudes and multitudes of them. Um, and so the, the, immensity of God's creation but at the same time grasshoppers aren't always a great thing you know it's basically a locust and locusts don't come out well in a lot of these stories either and so intended do you think it's intended to be that sort of putting them down in terms of like you know the inhabitants of the earth are are like swarms who just come and land in a field and decimate it I, I get I get this contrast here between he who sits above the circle of the earth, and that's just that's right. a huge image. And then all these teeny tiny little grasshoppers, it puts me in my place and says to me, you know, God, God is big, and mm -hmm. I am really not. Right. And it it plays, is, go ahead. Sorry, it, it plays off that uh, previous verse um, talking about the foundation of the earth. So you were way down in the belly and now you're way up above and that's where God is. Um, so we can be it, grasshoppers. Yeah, we, we can be grasshoppers. And that's a, it's an interesting way to think about the cosmology of that. Uh, Cause there, there's an emphasis on the separation there, mm -hmm. but this is also the prophet who introduces us to the, the, the name Emmanuel which is God with us. And we're, we're back and forth between that. And so it's almost, it, it, it's almost like there's, um, well, if you're hearing the word of God, it's almost like the sound is coming. It's bouncing off of all parts of this mm -hmm. and filling it up. God, it starts from above, but then, then the sound of the voice, the, the voice hits all of those parts that he's, he's stretched out and created, but now, well, breathes life into it, I think. Brings life into it, and then look look a little further down. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. We're, it, it, it's I brief. Mean, breathes life into it and death into it. Right. Right? Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown. When he blows them up and they wither, and they're carried away like stubble. It's It's like you know, grasshoppers create stubble in a field that then right. blows away in the wind. So there's a, there's like a circle of life thing happening here. Right, right. And then who are we comparing him to? So this, this is part of that, of one of Isaiah, it's a theme in Isaiah, and we're hitting it pretty hard in our daily office readings also, uh, where we're really starting to understand it explains what the danger of idols is, right? Um, I remember trying to explain this to a Sunday school once and said, well, none of us worship idols anymore. That was just back in the old days or some religions have a lot of statues like 
we have our fair share of statues, first of all. And uh, I mean, look at the National Cathedral for crying out loud. Or if we don't have a statue, we have it in stained glass. And we have plenty, we have plenty of graven images around, right? Um, but what but what is the danger of of these images? And I think I think this is the answer to it that we're hearing. And so Isaiah goes on this this whole tirade against the images in other passages before this about how the danger is we have instead of worshiping the creator we're worshiping something that has been created uh, and so this this question to whom then will you compare me or who is my equal uh who created these and so the emphasis on is on that creation and the way that that uh, it makes God the only worthy one to be worshipped, right? Right. And I, I wonder what the what what do we compare God to? What is what does it mean to compare God to something? Um, because it always fails. And I mean, sometimes we do that consciously, right? I mean. It, yeah. This prophet speaking to this ancient people who had kind of lost their way, fallen away from God, were worshiping idols, meaning worshiping graving in images, and actually at the forefront of their mind thinking, this is a God. This is, mm -hmm. there is a, there is something divine represented in this, in this artifact, this created thing. Mm -hmm. um, today, we don't do that so much, right? But uh, Let's think a little bit about the things that we place enormous value in, that we spend a lot of time looking at, that get draw all our attention from us, that um, potentially take us away from worshiping the God who created everything. And the first thing I can think of is that. Uh, right. <laughs> right? I mean, just to put it mildly, um, this can become an idol in my life. I don't think it's a God. I don't think it's divine. I'm not confused that this made the earth. I understand it's created. And yet I spend some time worshiping that every day. So when I do that, when I allow that to distract my attention from God, I don't know that I'm consciously comparing it to God, but I'm allowing it to take a parallel place with God. And I think this pat this verse speaks to that. Will you compare me to an iPhone, says the Holy One? You can fill right. it in. With, you can fill it in with whatever is your iPhone. I always I, I I tell myself that I'm on my Bible app all the time, but finally I just I disabled the notice telling me how much screen time I had. I just <laughs> I, I didn't want to see it. Right. <laughs> so uh. Can you tell me, um, if, yes, Nancy, if scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown? What do they refer to? So, refer looks like the antecedent of that would be the rulers of the earth, rulers and the princes, and so forth. That, I mean, so I'm just I'm doing this I just the most grammatical way I could do this. Now, my Hebrew is far far rustier than yours Rebecca but is that I, I, just on a grammatical level is that how that would work you're so complimentary I never took Hebrew in my life I took Greek and that's it so you're doing right that. way better than mine <laughs> but here's what I'd say as an English major who reads that whole sentence as it's been translated there are a couple of antecedents there it, the the sentence begins it is he who sits above the circle of the earth yeah and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Yeah, so we, have, we have inhabitants of the earth. And then a little further down, we have princes and we have rulers of the earth. And I might suggest that all of them, all the inhabitants, all the princes, all the rulers, one thing that is common about us is we get born and in the blink of an eye, uh, uh, we're gone. We wither and we blow away. I wonder if the, would you would you say that applies to the heavens also? I mean, we we have that we 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 have that 
that with those words from Jesus, heaven and earth will pass away. Yeah. I wonder, it, it, Maybe. You think this is, I'm yeah. not sure that's, that, I'm not sure that's as strong a connection. I'm not sure it is, but, but I think the others are. Yeah. I think the I, I think, opening is like, I'm God, I made it all, and you, you're not. You're here one day and you're gone the next. And it doesn't matter uh, if you're a prince or a ruler, that's still true. Right. Oh. <laughs> uh, if, if only it were okay to reference Bill Cosby these days, right? He's, he would say, uh, I brought you into this world, I'll take you out. <laughs> yep. I think that's what God's saying. Right. Um, I may go back and edit that bit out later. <laughs> you, can just so, that, you know, until we realized uh, the magnitude of the sins, the sinner was kind of a funny guy. Right. So, so it's a kind of was, put us in perspective that we cannot yes. think we're like God. We, we should think we're more like shovel. And, yeah. Uh, you know, we can strive, but um, we'll never get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Holly, you were about to say something also. Well, I have a question and I just, because I don't actually get this and I probably should. Scarcely. What does that mean? Scarcely are they planted? Scarcely sown? To me, is that, uh, is that a time reference or a volume of measure or? Um, I, I, I think. I think it's a time reference. Okay. And I that's too. Like no sooner are they planted. I think measure, but oh, okay, because that is sort of what you were saying a minute ago that, you know, you're here and then in a poof, you're gone. And that is for sure. Okay. Or right, sorry, Father Chris, what were you saying? I was just saying, I was, I was going to agree with that. It's, okay. it's kind of the blink of an eye. It's like, okay. I, I just, so like I barely finished, I scarcely finished doing that. And now it's right. over with. Okay. Um, I, just, I, I uh, think it's good. Okay. Um, I like the idea of thinking about comparing things to God, though. Uh, that that has always interested me, especially when um, when we think about, you know, yes, the Lord is my shepherd, but the Lord's not really a shepherd, right? Um, he's kind of like he's he's an idealized shepherd. God as Father, you know, I think about this a lot on Father's Days. Like there, you know, and some people they have a lot of uh, there's a lot caught up with the images that we use uh, for God because it's always a comparison and it it always falls short mm -hmm. right I mean I think about um, I've thought about this when I've when I've had to preach on Father's Day before it's that when we say it, it's we, we're not saying God is like a father we're saying that the best things that a father does are like God. And so it switches the way we compare things. And so I, I, I wonder if God here is asking us to think about that when we compare, are, are we comparing God to something else or are we saying the best things about these things are what remind us of God? I've thought about that before. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can get my head around it always. I, I almost feel like it's it's human nature. This is how we're designed to understand things. We have to have analogies. I, I see that. In fact, I was complaining last night. They were trying to explain a situation on the news last night. And I said, well, that's really confusing the analogy they're using. <laughs> but anyway, so maybe, maybe it's just a word of caution. I know you're going to use comparisons and analogies to try to understand me, but Remember, it's not exactly the same thing. I don't know. So, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, the metaphors we use for God are really important. And at least until we get to the New Testament and the incarnation, uh, people, most people had never seen God. And we are very concrete. It's the way God made our brains to be. So I can understand an apple because I've touched it and I've held it and I've taken a bite out of it and I've smelled and tasted it. And I can't use any of my senses to get to know God. At least that's my, my gut is how do I get to know somebody I can't know, see, taste, smell, hear, etc. And 
I mean, I, I think they ran around after a lot of material items trying to solve that problem. And, and the prophet's response here is, you know, don't, don't do that. Those, yeah. those metaphors for God, those comparisons are all going to fail. I guess, I guess then it does devolve into, I mean, eventually you come to the point where you have made a physical idol. Um, one, one thing that you know, struck me about that was that um, you know, metaphors are important because you can, it's something you can relate to, which reminds me of Jesus in his parables, that he would speak a, and teach a lesson using the language of the people to whom he's speaking. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's sort of like this. You, it's not actually true. You know, you can't literally say what he's saying is true. But they can relate to it. And so we can relate to God through the different metaphors that we have for Which is in some sense, I mean, this, this text seems to be working against misunderstanding the things that help us to understand God and mistaking them for God, right? Um, the kind of balance to that is we've got to be careful about not always using the same metaphor because no metaphor we use for God is ever going to get that comparison right. So we better be prepared to draw from a variety of places. Right, right. And so, so it is tight. Yeah, anytime, anytime you you're making that comparison, you're you're walking a. That's kind of a razor's edge. Um, you you've got you've got to hit that balance just right. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to try to understand God apart from, I suppose, how he reveals himself or um, I mean this. And, you know, it, it takes me, uh, he, it takes me down to this, this question that he asks down a little bit further. Mm -hmm. um, so have you, why why are you saying jacob why are you saying israel my way is hidden from the lord and my right is disregarded by my god um i think when you start i i, I think the the finitude of everything you compare with god creeps into every image you can make for yourself about god um so there's there's this idea that there are things that escape God's notice, right? Or, and and there are there are a lot of stories like that. I, mean, I wonder, you know, what happened when you know, you hear the story in the garden where God is looking for Adam and Eve, and that that has always puzzled me because surely God knew what was up. Um, but this idea that we can hide the idea that we can abscond of um, that's you know that's that's one of these dangers i think there's a tension in scripture there's evidence that people think they can hide their behavior from god and then there's for example the psalmist who says where can i go to hide from your presence O lord mm-hmm if I go here, if I go there, if I go down to the land of the dead, you're always, you're always there before me. So we both, we both know that we can't hide from God and yet act a lot of the time as if we can. Yeah. So that's interesting. I, you know, on first reading this, I just got this overall sense of comfort, but there is a, there's a, balancing of comfort and caution comfort and caution and then they end with a metaphor or you know like wings of eagles so yeah uh, how do you get you know. to the, how do you get to the wings like eagles yeah but that's that's, that's definitely a metaphor, you know? so, it's a metaphor yeah. but but to get to that metaphor to arrive at that place of comfort right yeah you're waiting, you're waiting for the lord those right for the Lord shall renew their strength. Right. Um, well, yeah, and then the other the other thing too to think think when he says, "Oh Jacob and O Israel," he 
he's talking about it's one thing for us it's one thing for me to think that i can hide something from all of you i can't right um and then it, i think that i can hide it from god but when when god says oh jacob he's he's talking about the whole nation yeah and how is it that a nation thinks that it can hide something from god i mean that that is a that is a pretty <laughs> large scale of something you're trying to to hide isn't it <laughs> i mean well, do we think that it's, it's <laughs> interesting to think about that question and to think about the context of the book of isaiah right the book uh -huh. of isaiah we know was written over many many years uh, in potentially in three phases. The first part of it to a people who really did think they could hide from God and who really were running around worshiping all sorts of things that, um, that were misplaced. Uh, but then in the middle, the book takes this turn and it's almost as though someone took up the mantle of Isaiah and, his, and those who followed him as, as uh, students uh, and began to write because in the middle of the book, the people go into exile and attribute that to their attempts to hide from God and they're going astray. And after they've been in exile a while, a prophet in the vein of Isaiah begins to speak to the exiles. And that turn happens in this chapter. So it's not surprising that this passage feels comforting. This chapter of Isaiah begins comfort. Oh, comfort says my people says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry out to her that she has served her term, right? Exile is coming to an end. Mm -hmm. And so what you're pointing out about the text here is there is an element of comfort in knowing how great God is, how vast God is, on the idea that God could take us under God's wings and renew us. But that relationship comes with a warning. <laughs> Don't mess it up again, right? Mm. We did before. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then, you know, fit it, you know, bringing it home here, this, this reminds me a lot of, um, it seems like we've heard quite a bit of the Magnificat and of Hannah's Mm -hmm. uh, song it's it's this constant theme about uh reversing roles uh reversing power structures here because it gives power to the strength power to the faint and strengthens the powerless even the youth will faint and be weary well it's about time um <laughs> and the young will fall exhausted right uh, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles, run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Uh, waiting on the Lord. That, that is very hard to think about, right? I mean, so just be patient. Um, it reminds me that... Uh, waiting and suffering come from the same word patience huh. right passion um oh. it's um uh, enduring something i think is the is is the idea behind it i was hoping you had better hebrew than mine but uh so because i can't remember if there's a difference but that's out the window now, thanks. <laughs> I think that's the point, right? The prophet yeah. here is speaking to people who are in exile mm -hmm. and all they wanna do is run home to the promised land. Right. And the prophet and the end of the exile has not yet come, but is in their near future. And this prophet is speaking to them saying, wait, be patient. Wait for the Lord. Save up your strength. Let God renew your strength. That flight home is coming, but it's not here yet. And I think you're exactly right that the patience that they're going to have, that they're that is required of them now, is directly 
connected with the ongoing suffering of still being in the exile, still being in Babylon. Yeah. I think you're you're spot on there. So Eddie, help me with my Herodotus, please. Um, <laughs> so if you're like Rebecca says, this is this is that shift where Isaiah is turning and talking about their turn. It is only a couple of chapters now uh, before we get to this long uh, ode to Cyrus, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and si- so so just to, to recap the history of this in uh, 587 BC. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians come, they destroy Jerusalem and take all of Israel into captivity in Babylon. Um, Cyrus comes along. We, we, we know that it's, is it when 539 is the, is the return? Is that right, Rebecca? It's longer than that. It's longer than that. It's like 70 or 80 years, isn't it? Right, five, 519 or something like that. So, um, Eddie, can you help me remember? So, so you, you, start, you start to see this. It is, it is Nehemiah that sees a Persian emperor sends Nehemiah back to rebuild Jerusalem. In the middle of that, Cyrus uh, and the Persians conquer Babylon. So the people who conquered Israel have now been conquered by somebody else. Right. And, uh, and, the, and Israel's fortunes start to rise. So it seems like we're in the period here. Uh, what, what, what is the period between uh, Cyrus and Artaxerxes? Can you recall? Uh, <clears throat> well, I don't know. I'd have to get out a history book. Okay. I mean, it's not immediate. I mean, there's, there's, there are several decades intervening there when Israel's fortunes are starting to ascend. And, um, and then, um, and then their eventual return. I think it's, it's, it's also worth noting that all of these, um, these passages about comparing God to something else uh, are when Israel really feeds, it really meets its first true monotheistic culture in its history, right? Um, Israel had always been surrounded by other people who had their gods, and it was no big deal for them to say, okay, you've got your God, we've got our God, we believe ours is bigger and better than yours. Now, we might we might hedge our bets a little bit and sacrifice a little here and a little there just to make sure we're covered. But this is Israel's first real encounter with, with people who believe, no, there, there, there is only one God. And the, the Persians were that people, right? And so this is, you know, the, compar- the comparison thing is something that, that they're having to get their heads around even in this um what do you do with that what what do you do with this idea that there really are no other gods are you asking me or are you asking i'm throwing it open (laughs) but if you've got an idea I'm, I'm, i'm i'm so I, I, I do that and, thing, and it's a bad Bible habit of mine, I say, go Yeah, ahead. the Bible complicates it even further because later on we'll hear the prophet Isaiah describe uh, the Persian king as God's messenger, as yeah. God's um, agent on earth. As God's anointed, in fact, you know, it, it, you know, an actual Messiah, which is, that's a really strange thing. It is. Um, especially as we project back, we, we, we've talked a little bit in this series about what Messiah means and how it, it takes on something very different when we talk about Jesus. But um, and I guess that makes it even stranger for us to think of Cyrus as Messiah, right? Um, this is, 
it, 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 it's a very disorienting passage. It's a very comforting passage, but you know, like, like Holly was saying, it's not so much uh, discomfort, it's disorientation. I think that, that we, that I feel a lot of when I, when I read through this. Um, has anybody else got anything on this? I, I, we're, we're at uh, 10 after the hour and we have not gotten to the gospel yet. I, I, but is there anything, well, go ahead. I would just say, sorry, I couldn't answer your question about Cyrus, but to me, this passage is so powerful because of the ring composition. Um, you know, you begin with the, have you not known, have you not heard? And then you go through blah, 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 blah. And then it comes right back. Have you not known? Have you not heard? And the central message of the whole passage, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Um, that is like pounding on the head with a mallet, I think. <laughs> right. Or to me anyway. Which also disorients me when I get hit in the head with a mallet. <laughs> but yes it, i mean the passage opens with that and then comes back to that and relationship with that god is what is what renews our strength equips us to soar like eagles and to persevere which epistle is it that which we have known from the beginning that which we have seen with our eyes which is that I'm drawing a blank. Isn't that Hebrews? I I thought that was that was Corinthians and talking about I I could be wrong. It may be. It's first John. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> the beginning of first John. I asked the Google machine. Oh <laughs> all right. I Google so good, y'all. <laughs> you call call Google and ask them, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, well. So that are we switching to the gospel, or did you want to? I think so. I think so. I just wanted to kind of throw it open there to see if if anybody had anything. I I, I don't want to. Now we're at fourteen after, so I, I, and I know everybody's got things to do today. I, I don't. I don't want to miss it but is there anything that was just sticking out with anybody before we move on it's a lot this is a lot longer than the gospel we have all right once twice gone all right so the gospel we have again we're, we're still we're still in the first chapter of mark five weeks into the first chapter of mark um there is a lot packed in here of course the gospel of mark let's see does he say immediately in here it's like he says it every third word, right? Let's take a look. So after Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, let's see, I'm, I, got, I got buzzed. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed, and Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. Mm -hmm. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring towns that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. And so this is, uh, and so that's the gospel we have for us today. This is on the heels of last week when Jesus cast out the first demon. Mm -hmm. And the demon identifies him as the Holy One of God. We talked about that last week. There are still a lot of demons around here. 
So um, I, I've i got a lot going on in this passage. Um, I like the way the, the joke I always heard was, you know, when Jesus comes and heals Peter's mother-in-law, it's like the, you know, the first time, like, gee, thanks, right? Um, you know, but, I always got real wound up about that passage. Tell she, me about that. She's in bed with a fever. This poor woman. I mean, I, if I'm not incorrect, this is still on the Sabbath. She's Seems bed, right. She's in bed with a fever and she has company. And the hospitality, the guests, is so important in this culture. And particularly on the Sabbath, to welcome someone into your home on the Lord's day, on the day of rest, it's so important in this culture. And she is so sick that she cannot keep that obligation. So this is like laying in the bed, you know this fever, your eyes hurt anytime you move your eyeballs inside your skull, it hurts to do anything including to use the bathroom. I mean, she's in bad shape. And, and it's he, not a bathroom. Remember, this is like, <laughs> you, you got to go someplace. Right. right. This is true. <laughs> and he comes in and lifts her up and the fever leaves her. And the whole point of that is she began to serve them. I mean, that just really ticked me off for a long time. <laughs> I got a lot of women on this call and I know you're going to understand me when I say that, right? Like this poor woman didn't even get to like, come to the table after I've had a fever and the fever leaves me, I need to sit at that table and have somebody bring me a bowl of chicken soup. <laughs> yes, I, I noticed that. <laughs> so uh, I and really she's got a lot of company here too, right? Exactly. <laughs> I really Everybody's really coming. Really uh, and then I took Greek. Mm. And I realized that when he takes her by the hand, first of all, he doesn't just he doesn't just come in and, and grab her hand and say, oh, Karen, it's going to be all right, and stroke it. The word is he seizes her. He seizes her by the He grabs a hold of her, and he lifted her up. Do you see that? That word there is agero. It's used again in Mark. It is what, ha what the angel says to the women when they visit the tomb. He is not here. He has been agarrowed. He has been lifted up. He has been resurrected. So he resurrects her here. Wow. I, I, I had not put that together with chapter 16. Um, and then the fever, there's another one you put it together with. Then the fever left her and she began to diakosune them. Oh boy. He began to minister to them. Same word for what the angels did to Jesus at the end of 40 days in the wilderness. Yeah. He resurrects her and she begins to do the service that God calls all of us to do. It's right. Well, and Diaco yeah, go Diaco ahead. Soon, I mean, you know, practicing diaconia. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. Um, Yes. Um, so so this being not, a deacon. This, this is not just, we're hungry. Let me heal your mother-in-law so she can fix us a meal. This <laughs> is, someone is on her deathbed. I'm going to resurrect her because God has work for her to do. Which is pretty wow. powerful. I had not put those together. And it's been, and I am remiss in, um, Close your ears, Uncle. I uh, <laughs> I haven't. I I have not studied this particular passage passage in Greek. I'm out of the habit of going to Greek. Um, Hard to well, do in work week. I disown you. I disown you. I disown you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And then and then we're casting out more demons. I am still overwhelmed. And I, ta I talked about this in my sermon this last Sunday is about how commonplace it seems to be for there to be demons everywhere, you know? And if, it, if somebody possessed by a demon walked into St. Christopher's or Transfiguration, I think all of us would notice and it would make the newsletter. 
it mm-hmm. seems to be a pretty common thing happening around here. Demons just kind of show up in synagogues and show up at people's houses. And apparently there are a lot of them. Um, but I think and, that's good. And ahead. they're connected with illness, right? I mean. Yeah, something's wrong with the world. And, 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 and so many people are sick because of it, right? Yeah. Hmm. Somebody help me with the guy that says that he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Oh, yeah, that's great, isn't it? Well, it could be if you would share your insight with me. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a big theme that runs all the way through the Gospel of Mark, and people um, have given it a name, this messianic secret that for a long part of the book, Jesus is going about the work that he's been given to do. And he is not yet ready for people to fully understand who he is or what his mission is. And so for the first half of the book, as he goes about and heals and cures, you'll notice, and it'll say, and he sternly ordered him not to tell anyone what had happened. That's because Jesus isn't yet ready. What do people do when he sternly orders them not to go tell anybody what happened? They tell. They promptly ignore him. And the demons are some of the only people who, despite the fact that Jesus is trying to keep his identity a secret, the demons all know who he is. And because he's not ready for anybody else to know, he tries to silence them. But the demons over and over, we know who you are. You're the Messiah. We read that last week. We know who you are. You're the Messiah. Are you saying they know him from these interactions or uh, if if a demon is a person from these these encounters or they they already knew i don't quite get that if a if a demon is a personification of evil then jesus christ god in flesh shows up i think i mean i I don't know because i wasn't there but right but my understanding (laughs) of it is that that evil looks at Jesus and says, uh oh. <laughs> okay. Right. Got it. Got it. It's like the, the roaches in the Roach Motel. <laughs> 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 Don't go in there. <laughs> right. We're all going to die. You may know if they come into contact with Jesus, they, that's the end of them. Huh. All right. Yeah. And I, I think, too, I, I, think, I think, though, Holly, there, there's an open question about certainly they knew there was something about Jesus, that there was an anointing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Jesus has not revealed totally who he, Jesus only reveals himself fully in the resurrection. Uh-huh. And that hasn't happened yet. And, and I wonder whether on a supernatural level, they recognize God in the flesh or whether, whether they, they recognize the... <laughs> anointing in some way uh that that tips them off this is this is more than we've ever had to deal just like when we encountered jesus right the jesus is more than we can process at a given time um i i wonder if they recognize this is the son of god because if that is in fact the case it seems it doesn't seem like a real stretch uh to make the logical assumption that well killing this guy isn't going to work right but the but but evil continues to push that evil continues to tempt jesus um i i I think i i like to think that as stupid as evil is they're at least clever enough to know that they can't tempt god not to be god right so i i wonder what it is about that they are recognizing, whether it's the fullness of God in flesh or whether this is just something bigger than they've ever seen. Um, I'm not sure how you get into a really weird space in your head when you try to parse out what eternity means and what an awareness of eternity means and what a supernatural being, what kind of awareness a supernatural being might have of that. Um, But I, I think it speaks to how much greater God is and whether we can get our minds around that at this early stage. 
Yeah, you know, one of the things that I love about Mark, you could read Mark in one sitting. It's not very long. It's 16 chapters. Yep. And if y'all haven't done that lately, here at the outset of year B, when we're going to read from the Gospel of Mark all year, take, take two hours and sit down and read through the Gospel of Mark. Or you can find, often you can find a free audio book of it online. And there are several, some dramatized and some just read. And when you read through it, pay attention to who, who recognizes who Jesus is and who doesn't. I give you a clue. Even in the middle, when Jesus starts to try to tell the disciples who he is, they don't get it. But all the way through, the demons recognize who he is. And you can look and see who else recognizes in Jesus uh, there's a certain centurion at the end, for example, who says, surely this man was God's son. Look at that. He's an outsider, but he recognizes. Mm. Jews don't recognize. They kill him, right? So there's this play going on all the way through the gospel. And if you would, were to read it through in one sitting, you'd see that. And it's, and, and you're right, Chris, Father Chris, it's, it, the, these demons, they're everywhere. And they know something. What, what they know about eternity and what's in it for them is unclear, but they know this is not one to be trifled with. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Well, that's a great homework assignment. And yeah, <laughs> I will. Uh, I'll, so uh, when I post this on our Facebook page, I'll post a link uh, to an app that I really like about this that has a great um, audio component. Uh, it's the one that Max McLean reads on uh, on Bible Gateway. That's my that's my go to when I'm trying to do morning and evening prayer in the car. I'll I'll let him read to me. But um, but yes, I'll, I'll, I will certainly do that. And it's well, it's, it's it's a couple of hours, but uh, but there is there's a lot in there too. I mean, Mark takes very few words and does everything he possibly can with them. I've always found it fascinating, right? Mm -hmm. um, we are running, we are at the end of our hour. Um, there are a couple of things I'm gonna continue thinking about, uh, I especially like this idea, pursuing this idea about in the morning, going out to a deserted place mm -hmm. uh, to pray in the dark. It reminds me of being on a retreat. I, I like to go to Benedictine monasteries to go on retreat and that when they say getting up early to pray, they mean like two or three in the morning, right? Um, they're not kidding around about that. And there's something, there's something neat about that silence and going out. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be thinking some about that and the idea of everybody search Simon and his companions hunting uh, for Jesus. That's that's something I'm gonna try to parse out as well. Mm -hmm. um, we are at the end of our hour, and uh, and Rebecca, I really want to thank. This has been fantastic for us. This has been a lot of fun for me. I hope you've had a good time. Um, love it. This I love is, it. this is this has been this this whole series has been has been great so far. I think so. Uh, with that said, uh, it is eleven thirty. Would you close us with a prayer? I would sure love to. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Set us free, O oh God, from the bondage of our sins and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Uh, those of you who are joining us later on, uh, please, uh, I hope this ministry has been a blessing to you. If you'd like, please, uh, when you see it on YouTube, click subscribe to our channel. And if you hit that little bell icon, you will be notified every time we put something new up and you won't miss a single one of these. Uh, also, if this ministry has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting St. Christopher's in the, with the link that you'll find in the description of this video. I want to thank all of you for being here and have a great week. Thank you. Friends. Oh, okay. Right. Bye-bye. All right.